What is up, guys? You're about to listen to episode number 10 of the Third Floor Chronicles. That's right, guys. Double digits, number 10. This week's special guest, funny man John Henton, best known for his roles on Living Single. He was on the Hughleys. He's been on Politically Incorrect all the time. Letterman, The Tonight Show, real funny guy. Hope you guys enjoy it. This was recorded Sunday, June 26th, right before the 7 o'clock show. John, where's the first city you ever performed stand-up comedy at? Um, my first start uh, was in Cleveland, uh, my hometown. I, had a, I was going to Ohio State, took some time off because uh, I was about to get an apartment, so I was working uh, in a warehouse, and I was always clowning around at the warehouse, and there was an article in the a plane dealer, the Cleveland plane dealer, about uh, stand-up comedy, and at the end of it, it said that amateur night was Sunday. This was a Friday, so everybody dared me to go down to amateur night. So I went down uh, that Sunday. I didn't win, but uh, I had a couple of comics come up and say, hey, that's pretty good. I was like, all right, well, and I went back the next week and I won, and I've been doing comedy. I never went back to Ohio State and been doing comedy ever since. How long were you thinking about it before you actually did it? Just that uh, one week, that's it? I, no, that was it, that, was that, that Friday. Uh, they dared me. I went in the back of the warehouse, started writing down some jokes, and that Sunday I went down and did them. Were you doing like open mics and stuff after that? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I just um, just did the open micers, and then uh, then we started doing a little bar gigs. Were you doing like the same five minutes over and over, trying to figure out where? No, where I was where doing it? different stuff. See, that's the thing. I didn't know that you could do the same stuff over and over again. So I was trying to write every time I went on stage. I was trying to come up with some with some new stuff, man, because I didn't know that you could. <laughs> wait a minute, you know, they laughed at it once. I'm thinking it's gonna be the same audience, so I'm trying to write a different set. And then somebody said, "Wow, man, you're writing a lot." I'm like, "Well, yeah, man, you not you can't do the same stuff." Can and, you, and then I found out that you can. So. You, well, how many times were you hitting a stage during your first year, like on a weekly basis? How much do you think you were getting on stage? Um, that first year, it was um, well. They, they started emceeing me pretty uh, pretty early. Matter of fact, I, I got um, I got a gig in Pittsburgh at the Funny Bone, and the guy booked me as a feature, and I had just started, so I started doing that. And it was a couple little bar gigs. How'd you how'd you piece together that twenty five minutes? Uh, from from me going up and every time an amateur night and man I had I had a set you know so so by the time I, you know by the time uh, Jeff Snyder saw me at the um, at the Cleveland Comedy Club he said no nah, man you can go on and feature because I was doing like I do ten minutes up front and then uh, bring it up to the other guy. This was in the old days, you know, and you could do some time in between. So you know he saw at least 20, 25 minutes of, of material. Nice. How um how long were you doing comedy before you went out on the road? Um. That first gig in Pittsburgh, that was that was the first road gig. Other than the little bar gigs, and then it was a it was another amateur night in Warren. Warren had a Warren had a comedy club, uh, Warren, Ohio. They had a, a comedy club, so we do amateur nights there, a couple bar gigs, and then uh, then it was it was pretty. Uh, so you started featuring pretty quick, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, just at that one club. Now in, in Cleveland, they didn't feature me right away, but I, I did move up pretty quickly. Though. How long was it take before you started headlining clubs? Uh, I didn't really start headlining until. Um, Oh, that was after um, I, I was doing like some co-headlining type stuff. I worked so it took me about eight years, and then I got the Tonight Show, and then you know after. How did the, I'm glad you brought that up. How did that happen? Did someone see you in a, at a show? How yeah. did that work out? Yeah, it was a, a comedy. What it was, it was a comedy competition. It was the Johnny Walker Comedy Search. You and won that, right? I won that in L.A. And um, the talent coordinator for the Tonight Show was there. So after I won, he just came up to me. I didn't even have to ask him. He just came up and said, "You got the Tonight Show," and he said, "Some of that material you can do. Some of it you can't. Come into my office and we'll work on the set." But I was how just, long from that conversation did you actually have the Tonight Show performance? Uh, let's see. This was. Let's see. This was April. I think it was like about a month, month and a half, maybe. Because how did you prepare June. for that? Um. I just went in, you know, it was like when, when the coordinator is saying you got it and he likes what you're doing. And so when, when, I, when I met with him, it wasn't like it was a whole bunch of stuff that we had to tinker with. And he just said, you can do most of this. So all I had to do was put in like a couple. It was only like, a, you know, you know a little five minutes. Seven. How much time did you do at the, the John Walker competition that he's seen you perform? Like I, 20 minutes? I think we did. 
No, because it was a bunch of cats, man. I think it was like maybe maybe ten minutes. Okay, so you only needed like half of that set for yeah, the tonight show. Maybe like a, like a ten. Minute. But I know we did at least ten minutes for the finals. At least ten, maybe fifteen for the finals. So for that month, are you just trying to razor edge that five minutes down? Yeah, well, I mean that was pretty much my set because that was the set that it, that he had liked in nice. the first place. So I'm not gonna mess with yeah. that. So if if he said you can you can keep the jokes in, I kept that up until the one or two extra jokes I had to put in. But uh, he said I pretty much had a set. Now. That was cool. How was it after the Tonight Show? Once you did it, everyone's seen you on TV. How was, were you getting booked immediately yeah, after that? Yeah, then yeah. I got an agent, because I didn't have an agent before that. And uh, How after, did the agent, did they show up waiting for you? Did you no, have to call one? What happened was, after, when I did the Tonight Show, um, uh, Mr. Carson liked my set so much that he invited me over. And, you know, that's the biggest mm -hmm. thing, you know, at that time. That was, like, the biggest thing. And so I went over and I sat down with him. And he asked me um, a bunch of questions, and then he, uh, at one point he asked me, did I, had a, did I have an agent? And I just looked right at the camera, and I said, nope, I'm seeking representation as we speak. And he just started cracking up, and he said, well, I guarantee you, you'll have an agent soon. And um, uh, Mr. McCauley called me uh, the next day and said, come into the office. I came in, and it was two typewritten pages back in front of agents and managers that wanted to meet with me because Mr. Carson said I was fun. That was back in the day, man. It was like his last, I think that was like his last year, and he could just put you on the map. And he just said, you know, go ahead and run. So so were you just doing weekends after that? Just weekend after yeah, weekend? Yeah, yeah. Then, uh, then I started headlining. I got an agent. Um, were you ready for that headline? Like, as soon as you started headlining, did you already have, like, your hour ready to go? Um, I had, um... I had, a, I had a bunch of material. Um, only thing, you know, I, I just couldn't do the stuff that I did on, on the Tonight Show. That, that was it. But I had, I had jokes, man, because, um, you know, like I said, I was, I was working my way up. I was co-headlining co uh, a couple places. So I had the jokes and, you know, just sit down and, um, and just work on some stuff. And I think I might have uh, featured a couple times. And then, then I started, like a split week, you know, to where you go in, like on Wednesday and Thursday. And then, uh, like, Paul Rodriguez or somebody would come in on Friday. So I was doing those split weeks at first. Were they trying to get you in TV right away? Like the living single stuff? Was that something they wanted for you right away? Yeah, well, once I got the agent, you know, then they send you out on the audition. When pilot season comes up, you go out on the audition. So I think um, I think I got a, um, I, I shot a pilot in 90, uh, the, a year after I did the Tonight Show, and that didn't get picked up. And But I read for a lot of stuff. And um, then the next year I got Living Single. So it only took a couple of years after I got the agent. Were you still doing stand-up while you were on Living Single? Yeah, yeah. But not as much though, and that was, that, that was like the biggest mistake of my life because I was doing like, I was on the, I was a road dog, man. I was like 40 weeks a year, I was just doing it. And when I got Living Single, I was so happy to not have to do three shows on Saturday, you know, the weekend. I could just sit up and watch football, but that was, I mean, it was at the time that was what I wanted to do, just relax and stuff. But I didn't realize that how much money I was leaving out there, man. It was it was the dumbest thing I ever did in my life, man. But I was I just needed a break at the time, and I'm just blessed to you know still be able to do it, you know. As a stand-up working on Living Single, were you able to influence any of your lines on the show? Yeah, yeah. yeah? They they'd always um, they could work with you, and then uh, once the writers knew your personality and knew how you would how, how you. Um, you approach jokes and stuff, then they start writing for you, and then it was always a thing to where you try it their way a couple of times, and if you got, and if you see it falls flat, then you try something else. You got an audience out there, you know. I'm a comic, you know. Do some improv, you know. And try. So there was some improv on set. Yeah, yeah. You could you could throw in some stuff because, like I said, you do it for them because it's, it's a bunch of people getting paid a whole bunch of money to write this stuff. So you at least got to do that. But if it doesn't work, then uh, hey, you know, I'm a comic. I had to try to be funny. Did you see your audiences kind of grow pretty much instant, instantly after the show went on air? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was big because the, the show when it hit, it, it just hit so big because Martin Martin was already huge and Martin had started like a year before us and then they put us on Sunday night behind Martin and I think it was like Living Color Martin and us and it was just like this big you know Fox Sunday night and we 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 was running Sunday night so uh, we had the church crowd and. You know, and then, uh, you know, as you go on the road, then the, the crowds built in from that, you know, they came out.
What's your writing process like? Do you work a lot of stuff on stage, or do you sit home and write out material? Sit down, try to write it out. You you, you got to kind of visualize it. You know, you put it down and, and, and just let it sit for a while. Because some, sometimes you, you you write a joke and say, oh, I got to do this tonight. This is just fun. And then sometimes you write something down, and you, and you think it's funny at the time, but, you know, you might have been drinking, or you might have, you know, might have been something else influencing the decision. And, uh, you know, you just let it sit for a while. But a lot of times... You know, you, you got to trust your instincts, and you're like, if you write it down, and you, I, I had some jokes that I just let sit for a while, and then you try them, and they work like a champ, and it's like, that could have been a joke, I could have tried that night. So. Do you work out any new stuff on the road, or do you have like a home club that you kind of... Always on the road, always on the road. LA crowds are weird, man, as far as trying stuff, and sometimes you don't get the reaction, and when you try new stuff, if you do that joke and you get no response, you might not do that joke again, but at least on the road... Uh, in front of regular regular crowds, um, you get you get a better feedback. Kind of sneak it in and there then, too. then you know that you know I'm working all week, so I at least got a whole week I can try this out. And if it's no good, then I can drop it then. Got it. Yeah. Do you have a home club at all? Um, no, man. My, my home club now is uh, I'm, I'm working here. I'm down in Tampa all the time. I'm in Orlando. Um, I love. Um, Richmond, uh, Funny Bone, Cleveland, you know, that's the hometown club. So. How long have you been on the road currently on this stint right now? Um, this is just uh, just three weeks this time. Oh, okay. Yeah, just just three weeks um, in, a, in a row. And, um, uh, and then I take take a little time because summer's always slow for some reason. And then once football season starts, well, so I'm praying we have football season because once that starts, everything picks up. You ever been a victim of someone stealing any of your bits before? Yeah. How'd you handle that? Um, and how'd you find out, first of all? Somebody told me, it's like, hey, somebody's doing something similar. And then you go up and you talk to them. And, and, and it, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't a matter of somebody stealing stuff. It was like, you know, comics, you know, we, we watch the same TV shows and sometimes the same premises. But I, I've never had a direct somebody just stole something. So you, just had, you just had a similar bit, basically. Yeah, it was, it, that, that's what it was. And people, everybody thought it was. Because even, even when I talked to them, it's just, man, that's my bit. You know, it's, and my thing, I always say, hey, man, one thing you know. You might not like me, you might not think I'm funny, but I ain't never stole from anybody. And that's, that's my rep. How'd you settle? Did you both continue just kind of working? Yeah, out? you know, it was just like, well, you know, you, you got to the point where, hell, it, it's not that funny of a bit anyway, so I'm not going to argue about it. And it's like, we're not working the same room, so, you know, if somebody come up, hey, we know, you know. Besides the uh, Tonight Show gig, what was the other gig that you had where you just kind of like, wow, this is what I do, I made it? Um... Living single, man. I got yeah. that TV show. That was huge, and I started doing, uh, you know, guest appearances on, uh, you know, talk shows. I did Arsenio show, and I was like a regular guest on, you know, and when you're like a regular guest on, on that, and um, it was a really, um, I, I was really proud of um, the fact that I was on uh, the short list for um, uh, Bill Maher when he had Politically Incorrect, and he would always have people on there, and when somebody would cancel, I was like the first one that he would call because he knew that I, I did political stuff and he knew I could come in there. So I did a bunch of those shows. That really made me feel good. And uh, I guess the biggest gig I did was the um, uh, the Superdome in uh, New Orleans for the Essence Festival. 80,000 people laughing. Now explain how how that's different compared to a comedy club. How do you how do you project your, your material in front of 80,000 You just do it. You got a microphone that's echoing everywhere and you just got this big dome. You can't see anything with these bright lights, but it's people cracking up, man. Can you it's, can you tell or is it just loud the whole time or can you hear No, it's it? like the punchline when you hit it, man, and and that's what I'm saying, man. It is not it's nothing like that. When you get 80,000 people laughing at your jokes, man. That, you feel it, yeah, right? Oh, it's huge, man. I mean, you know, and, and it's just like, man, you can't tell me nothing. I'm <laughs> this is always a favorite question everyone wants to hear answered. Describe the worst bombing you've ever had on stage. Worst bombing? At um, any point in your career. Uh, it was one bad set. Um, I went back home. It was a little club in Cleveland because I went out to L.A. and I was working. I was doing them. Um, I was working at the Comedy Act Theater, and you know, I was meeting, you know, Martin Lawrence, and I knew a bunch of, you know, the cats that was coming up at Arsenio, and the cats that was coming up at the time, and um, it was a, a little bar, uh, uh, little, little little club in Cleveland that was doing comedy, and I went back there. And um, man, they heckled me, and I had my family, and my family came out because they hadn't seen me in a while, and I was just on stage cussing and fussing, and it was just like the worst. Yeah, that was the absolute worst. They didn't like anything I had to say, so it was just combat comedy. Plus your family's there. And my too, family's there, right? and I'm like, Mama, sorry, I got a cuss, but she's like, man, do your business, you know, so and that's what we did. Appreciate it, my friend. Uh, thank you, bro. Thank you. All right, now.
Well, there you have it, folks. Episode number 10 is in the books, as we like to say around here. And if you like what you heard from John Hinton, be sure to check him out online. See when he's coming to your city. Check out some YouTube clips. Go to Amazon. He's a real funny, amazing guy. The shows all weekend were great. Great response from the crowd. My name is Joe Riga. Check out my website, joeriga.com. And on behalf of the Improv and John Hinton, thank you so much for listening.